the symposium or banquet of the ten virgins or on chastity by saint methodius persons of the dialogue eubolius gregorion arete marcella theophila thalia theopatra thalusa agatha priscilla thecla tusian domnina introduction plan of the work way to paradise description and personification of virtue the agnos a symbol of chastity marcella the eldest and foremost among the virgins of christ eubolios you have arrived most seasonably gregorian for i have just been looking for you waiting to hear of the meeting of marcella and theopatra and of the other virgins who were present at the banquet and of the nature of their discourses on the subject of chastity for it is said that they argued with such ability and power that there was nothing lacking to the full consideration of the subject if therefore you have come here for any other purpose put that off to another time and do not delay to give us a complete and connected account of the matter of which we are inquiring Gregorion. I seem to be disappointed of my hope, as someone else has given you intelligence beforehand on the subject respecting which you ask me. For I thought that you had heard nothing of what had happened, and I was flattering myself greatly with the idea that I should be the first to tell you of it. And for this reason I made all haste to come here to you, fearing the very thing which has happened that someone might anticipate me. Be comforted, my excellent friend, for we have had no precise information respecting anything which happened, since the person who brought us the intelligence had nothing to tell us except that there had been dialogues. But when he was asked what they were and to what purpose, he did not know. Well, then, as I came here for this reason, do you want to hear all that was said from the beginning? Or shall I pass by parts of it, and recall only those points which I consider worthy of mention? By no means the latter. But first, Gregorion, relate to us from the very beginning where the meeting was, and about the setting forth of the foods, and about yourself, how you poured out the wine. They pledged each other in golden cups, while toward broad heaven they looked up. <laughs> you are always skillful in discussions, and excessively powerful in argument, thoroughly confuting all your adversaries. It is not worth while, Gregorion, to contend about these things at present. But do oblige us by simply telling us what happened from the beginning. Well, I will try. But first, answer me this. You know, I presume, Arete, the daughter of Philosophia? Why do you ask? We went by invitation to a garden of hers with an eastern aspect to enjoy the fruits of the season, myself and Procilla and Tusian. I am repeating the words of Theopatra, for it was of her I obtained the information. We went, Gregorion, by a very rough, steep, and arduous path. When we drew near the place, said Theopatra, we were met by a tall and beautiful woman walking along quietly and gracefully, clothed in a shining robe as white as snow. Her beauty was something altogether inconceivable and divine. Modesty blended with majesty bloomed on her countenance. It was a face, she said, such as I know not that I had ever seen, awe-inspiring, yet tempered with gentleness and mirth, for it was wholly unadorned by art and had nothing counterfeit. She came up to us 
and like a mother who sees her daughters after a long separation, she embraced and kissed each one of us with great joy, saying, Oh, my daughters, you have come with toil and pain to me, who am earnestly longing to conduct you to the pasture of immortality. Toilsomely have you come, by a way abounding with many frightful reptiles. For as I looked, I saw you often stepping aside, and I was fearing lest you should turn back and slip over the precipices. But thanks to the bridegroom to whom I have espoused you, my children, for having granted an effectual answer to all our prayers. And while she is thus speaking, said Theopatra, we arrive at the enclosure, the doors not being shut as yet. And as we enter, we come upon Thecla and Agatha and Marcella preparing to sup. And Arate immediately said, Do you also come hither, and sit down here in your place, along with these your fellows? Now, said she to me, we who were there as guests were altogether, I think, ten in number, and the place was marvelously beautiful and abounding in the means of recreation. The air was diffused in soft and regular currents, mingled with pure beams of light, and a stream flowing as gently as oil through the very middle of the garden threw up a most delicious drink, and the water flowing from it, transparent and pure, formed itself into fountains, and these, overflowing like rivers, watered all the garden with their abundant streams. And there were different kinds of trees there, full of fresh fruits, and the fruits that hung joyfully from their branches were of equal beauty. And there were ever-blooming meadows strewn with variegated and sweet-scented flowers, from which came a gentle breeze laden with sweetest odor. And the Agnos grew near, a lofty tree under which we reposed, from its being exceedingly wide-spreading and shady. You seem to me, my good friend, to be making a revelation of a second paradise. You speak truly and wisely. When there, she said, we had all kinds of food and a variety of festivities, so that no delight was wanting. After this, Arate, entering, gave utterance to these words. Young maidens, the glory of my greatness, beautiful virgins who tend the undefiled meadows of Christ with unwedded hands, we have now had enough of fee food and feasting, for all things are abundant and plentiful with us. What is there, then, besides which I wish and expect? That each of you shall pronounce a discourse in praise of virginity. Let Marcella begin, since she sits in the highest place, and is at the same time the eldest. I shall be ashamed of myself if I do not make the successful disputant an object of envy, binding her with the unfading flowers of wisdom. And then, I think she said, Marcella immediately began to speak as follows. Reader's Note Arete means excellence or virtue, and obviously philosophia is philosophy. Some of the other characters are famous martyrs, whereas others seem to be more personifications. Marcella is one of the martyrs. End of Introduction The Banquet of the Ten Virgins by St. Methodius Discourse 1 Marcella Chapter 1 The Difficulty and Excellence of Virginity The Study of Doctrine Necessary for Virgins Virginity is something supernaturally great, wonderful, and glorious. And to speak plainly, and in accordance with the Holy Scriptures. This best and noblest manner of life alone is the udder of immortality, and also its flower and its first fruits. And for this reason, 
The Lord promises that those shall enter into the kingdom of heaven who have made themselves eunuchs. In that passage of the Gospels, in which he lays down the various reasons for which men have made themselves eunuchs. Chastity with men is a very rare thing, and difficult of attainment, and in proportion to its supreme excellence and magnificence is the greatness of its dangers. For this reason it requires strong and generous natures, such as, vaulting over the stream of pleasure, direct the chariot of the soul upwards from the earth, not turning aside from their aim, until having, by swiftness of thought, lightly bounded above the world, and taken their stand truly upon the vault of heaven, they purely contemplate immortality itself, as it springs forth from the undefiled bosom of the Almighty. Earth could not bring forth this draught. Heaven alone knew with the fountain from which it flows. For we must think of virginity as walking indeed upon the earth, but as also reaching up to heaven. And hence some who have longed for it, and considering only the end of it, have come, by reason of coarseness of mind, ineffectually with unwashed feet, and have gone aside out of the way, from having conceived no worthy idea of the virginal manner of life. For it is not enough to keep the body only undefiled, just as we should not show that we think more of the temple than of the image of the God, but we should care for the souls of men as being the divinities of their bodies, and adorn them with righteousness. And then do they most care for them and tend them, when striving and untiringly to hear divine discourses, they do not desist until, wearing out the doors of the wise, they attain to the knowledge of the truth. For as the putrid humors and matter of flesh, and all those things which corrupt it, are driven out by salt, in the same manner all the irrational appetites of a virgin are banished from the body by divine teaching. For it must needs be that the soul which is not sprinkled with the words of Christ, as with salt, should stink and breed maggots, as King David, openly confessing with tears in the mountains, cried out, My wounds stink and are corrupt, because he had not salted himself with the exercises of self-control, and so subdued his carnal appetites, but self-indulgently had yielded to them and became corrupted in adultery. And hence, in Leviticus, every gift, unless it be seasoned with salt, is forbidden to be offered as an oblation to the Lord God. Now, the whole spiritual meditation of the Scriptures is given to us as salt, which stings in order to benefit us, and which disinfects, without which it is impossible for a soul by means of reason, to be brought to the Almighty. For you are the salt of the earth, said the Lord to the apostles. It is fitting, then, that a virgin should always love things which are honorable, and be distinguished among the foremost for wisdom, and addicted to nothing slothful or luxurious, but should excel and set her mind upon things worthy of the state of virginity, always putting away, by the word, the foulness of luxury, lest in any way some slight hidden corruption should breed the worm of incontinence. For the unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, how she may please the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit says the blessed Paul. But many of them who consider the hearing of the word quite a secondary matter think they do great things if they give their attention to it for a little while. But 
discrimination must be exercised with respect to these. For it is not fitting to impart divine instruction to a nature which is careful about trifles, and lo, and which counterfeits wisdom. For would it not be laughable to go on talking to those who direct all their energy toward things of little value, in order that they may complete most accurately those things which they want to bring to perfection, but who do not think that the greatest pains are to be taken with those necessary things by which most of all the love of chastity would be increased in them. CHAPTER Two. Virginity, a plant from heaven, introduced late. The advancement of mankind to perfection. How arranged. For truly, by a great stretch of power, the plant of virginity was sent down to men from heaven, and for this reason it was not revealed to the first generations. For the race of mankind was still very small in number, and it was necessary that it should first be increased in number, and then brought to perfection. Therefore the men of old times thought it nothing unseemly to take their own sisters for wives, until the law coming separated them, and by forbidding that which at first had seemed to be right, declared it to be a sin, calling him cursed who should uncover the nakedness of his sister. God, thus mercifully bringing to our race the needful help in due season, as parents do to their children. For they do not at once set masters over them, but allow them during the period of childhood to amuse themselves like young animals, and first send them to teachers stammering like themselves, until they cast off the youthful wool of the mind and go onward to the practice of greater things, and from thence again to that of greater still. And thus we must consider that the God and Father of all acted toward our forefathers. For the world, while still unfilled with men, was like a child, and it was necessary that it should first be filled with men, and so grow to manhood. But when, hereafter, it was colonized from end to end, the race of man spreading to a boundless extent, God no longer allowed man to remain in the same ways, considering how they might now proceed from one point to another, and advance nearer to heaven, until, having attained to the very greatest and most exalted lesson of virginity, they should reach to perfection. That first they should abandon the intermarriage of brothers and sisters, and marry wives from other families, and then that they should no longer have many wives, like brute beasts, as though born for mere propagation of the species, and then that they should not be adulterers, and then again that they should go on to continence, and from continence to virginity, when, having trained themselves to despise the flesh, they sail fearlessly into the peaceful haven of immortality. CHAPTER three. By the circumcision of Abraham, marriage with sisters forbidden. In the times of the prophets, polygamy put a stop to. Conjugal purity itself by degrees enforced. If, however, any one should venture to find fault with our argument, as destitute of Scripture proof, we will bring forward the writings of the prophets, and more fully demonstrate the truth of the statements already made. Now Abraham, when he first received the covenant of circumcision, seems to signify by receiving circumcision in a member of his own body, nothing else than this, that one should no longer beget children with one born of the same parent, 
showing that every one should abstain from intercourse with his own sister as his own flesh. And thus, from the time of Abraham, the custom of marrying with sisters has ceased. And from the time of the prophets, the contracting of marriage with several wives has been done away with. For we read, Go not after thy lusts, but refrain thyself from thine appetites. For wine and women will make men of understanding to fall away. And in another place, Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Manifestly forbidding a plurality of wives. And Jeremiah clearly gives the name of fed horses to those who lust after other women. And we read, The multiplying brood of the ungodly shall not thrive, nor take deep rooting from bastard slips, nor lay any fast foundation. Lest, however, we should seem prolix in collecting the testimonies of the prophets, let us again point out how chastity succeeded to marriage with one wife taking away by degrees the lusts of the flesh, until it removed entirely the inclination for sexual intercourse engendered by habit. For presently one is introduced, earnestly deprecating from henceforth this seduction, saying, O Lord, Father, and Governor of my life, leave me not to their counsels. Give me not a proud look, let not the greediness of the belly nor lust of the flesh take hold of me. And in the Book of Wisdom, a book full of all virtue, the Holy Spirit, now openly drawing his hearers to continence and chastity, sings in this wise, Better it is to have no children and to have virtue, for the memorial thereof is immortal because it is known with God and with men. When it is present, men take example of it, and when it is gone, they desire it. It weareth a crown, and triumpheth for ever, having gotten the victory, striving for undefiled rewards. Chapter 4 Christ alone taught virginity, openly preaching the kingdom of heaven the likeness of God to be attained in the light of the divine virtues. We have already spoken of the periods of the human race, and how beginning with the intermarriage of brothers and sisters, it went on to continence. And we have now left for us the subject of virginity. Let us then endeavor to speak of this as well as we can. And first let us inquire for what reason it was that no one of the many patriarchs and prophets and righteous men who taught and did many noble things either praised or chose the state of virginity. Because it was reserved for the Lord alone to be the first to teach this doctrine, since he alone, coming down to us, taught man to draw near to God for it was fitting that he who was first and chief of priests, of prophets, and of angels, should also be saluted as first and chief of virgins. For in old times man was not yet perfect, and for this reason was unable to receive perfection, which is virginity. For being made in the image of God, he needed to receive that which was according to his likeness, which the Word, being sent down into the world to perfect, he first took upon him our form, disfigured as it was by many sins, in order that we, for whose sake he bore it, might be able again to receive the divine form. For it is then that we are truly fashioned in the likeness of God, when we represent his features in a human life, like skillful painters, stamping them upon ourselves as upon tablets, learning the path which he showed us. 
and for this reason, he, being God, was pleased to put on human flesh, so that we, beholding as on a tablet the divine pattern of our life, should also be able to imitate him who painted it. For he was not one who, thinking one thing, did another, nor, while he considered one thing to be right, taught another. But whatever things were truly useful and right, these he both taught and did. Chapter 5 Christ, by preserving his flesh incorrupt in virginity, draws to the exercise of virginity. The small number of virgins in proportion to the number of the saints. What then did the Lord, who is the truth and the light, take in hand when he came down from heaven? He preserved the flesh which he had taken upon him incorrupt in virginity, so that we also, if we would come to the likeness of God and Christ, should endeavor to honor virginity. For the likeness of God is the avoiding of corruption. And that the Word, when he was incarnate, became chief virgin, in the same way as he was chief shepherd and chief prophet of the church, the Christ-possessed John shows us, saying in the book of the Revelation, And I looked, and, lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they who follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Showing that the Lord is leader of the choir of virgins. And remark, in addition to this, how very great in the sight of God is the dignity of virginity. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault. He says, And they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And he clearly intends by this to teach us that the number of virgins was, from the beginning, restricted to so many, namely, a hundred and forty-four thousand, while the multitude of the other saints is innumerable. For let us consider what he means when discoursing of the rest. I beheld a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. It is plain, therefore, as I said, that in the case of the other saints he introduces an unspeakable multitude while in the case of those who are in the state of virginity, he mentions only a very small number, so as to make a strong contrast with those who make up the innumerable number. This, O Arate, is my discourse to you on the subject of virginity. But if I have omitted anything, let Theophila, who succeeds me, supply the omission. End of Discourse 1 Marcella Banquet of the Ten Virgins by St. Methodius Discourse 2 Theophila Chapter 1 Marriage Not Abolished by the Commendation of Virginity And then, she said, Theophila spoke. 
since Marcella has excellently begun this discussion without sufficiently completing it, it is necessary that I should endeavor to put a finish to it. Now, the fact that man has advanced by degrees to virginity, God urging him on from time to time, seems to me to have been admirably proved. But I cannot say the same as to the assertion that from henceforth they should no longer beget children. For I think I have perceived clearly from the scriptures that after he had brought in virginity, the word did not entirely abolish the generation of children. For although the moon may be greater than the stars, the light of the other stars is not destroyed by the moonlight. Let us begin with Genesis, that we may give its place of antiquity and supremacy to this scripture. Now, the sentence and ordinance of God respecting the begetting of children is confessedly being fulfilled to this day, the Creator still fashioning man. For this is quite manifest, that God, like a painter, is at this very time working at the world, as the Lord also taught, My Father worketh hitherto. But when the rivers shall cease to flow and fall into the reservoir of the sea, and the light shall be perfectly separated from the darkness, for the separation is still going on, and the dry land shall henceforth cease to bring forth its fruits with creeping things and four-footed beasts, and the predestined number of men shall be fulfilled, then from henceforth shall men abstain from the generation of children. But at present man must cooperate in the forming of the image of God, while the world exists and is still being formed. For it is said, Increase and multiply. And we must not be offended at the ordinance of the Creator, from which, moreover, we ourselves have our being. For the casting of seed into the furrows of the matrix is the beginning of the generation of men. So that bone taken from bone, and flesh from flesh, by an invisible power, are fashioned into another man. And in this way we must consider that the saying is fulfilled, This is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. Matrix meaning mother. Chapter 2 Generation something akin to the first formation of Eve from the side and nature of Adam. God, the creator of men, in ordinary generation. And this, perhaps, is what was shadowed forth by the sleep and trance of the first man, which prefigured the embraces of connubial love. When thirsting for children, a man falls into a kind of trance, softened and subdued by the pleasures of generation, as by sleep, so that again something drawn from his flesh and from his bones is, as I said, fashioned into another man. For the harmony of the bodies being disturbed in the embraces of love, as those tell us who have experience of the married state, all the marrow-like and generative part of the blood, like a kind of liquid bone, coming together from all the members, worked into foam and curdled, is projected through the organs of generation into the living body of the female. And probably it is for this reason that a man is said to leave his father and his mother, since he is then suddenly unmindful of all things when united to his wife in the embraces of love. He is overcome by the desire of generation, offering his side to the divine Creator to take from it, so that the Father may again appear in the Son. Wherefore, if God still forms man, Shall we not be guilty of audacity, if we think the generation of children is something offensive? 
when the Almighty himself is not ashamed to make use of it in working with his undefiled hands. For he says to Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And to Job, Didst thou take clay and form a living creature, and make it speak upon the earth? And Job draws near to him, and supplication, saying, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me. Would it not, then, be absurd to forbid marriage unions, seeing that we expect that after us there will be martyrs, and those who shall oppose the evil one? for whose sake the word promised that he would shorten those days. For if the generation of children henceforth had seemed evil to God, as you said, for what reason will those who have come into existence in opposition to the divine decree and will be able to appear well-pleasing to God? And must not that which is begotten be something spurious and not a creature of God? if, like a counterfeit coin, it is molded apart from the intention and ordinance of the lawful authority? And so we concede to men the power of forming men. Chapter 3 An ambiguous passage of Scripture. Not only the faithful, but even prelates are sometimes illegitimate. But Marcella, interrupting, said, O oh, Theophila, there appears here a great mistake, and something contrary to what you have said. And do you think to escape under cover of the cloud which you have thrown around you? For there comes that argument which perhaps any one who addresses you as a very wise person will bring forward. What do you say of those who are begotten unlawfully in adultery? For you laid it down that it was inconceivable and impossible for any one to enter into the world unless he was introduced by the will of the divine ruler, his frame being prepared for him by God. And that you may not take refuge behind a safe wall, bringing forward the scripture which says, As for the children of the adulterers, they shall not come to their perfection, he will answer you easily that we often see those who are unlawfully begotten coming to perfection like ripe fruit. And if again you answer sophistically, O oh, my friend, by those who come not to perfection, I understand being perfected in Christ-taught righteousness, he will say, But indeed, my worthy friend, very many who are begotten of unrighteous seed are not only numbered among those who are gathered into the flock of the brethren, but are often called even to preside over them. Footnote. Bastardy seems to have been regarded as washed out by baptism, for thousands of pagan converts had been born under this stain. Since then it is clear, and all testify, that those who are born of adultery do come to perfection, we must not imagine that the Spirit was teaching respecting conceptions and births, but rather, perhaps, concerning those who adulterate the truth, who, corrupting the Scriptures by false doctrines, bring forth an imperfect and immature wisdom, mixing their error with piety. And therefore, this plea being taken away from you, come now, and tell us if those who are born of adultery are begotten by the will of God. For you said that it was impossible that the offspring of a man should be brought to perfection unless the Lord formed it and gave it life. Chapter 4 Human Generation and the Work of God Therein Set Forth Theophila, as though caught round the middle by a strong antagonist, grew giddy and with difficulty recovering herself, replied, "'You ask a question, my worthy friend, which needs to be solved by an example, that you may still better understand how the creative power of God, pervading all things, is more especially the real cause in the generation of men, 
making those things to grow which are planted in the production of earth. For that which is sown is not to be blamed, but he who sows in a strange soil by unlawful embraces, as though purchasing a slight pleasure by shamefully selling his own seed. For imagine our birth into the world to be like some such thing as a house having its entrance lying close to lofty mountains, and that the house extends a great way down, far from the entrance, and that it has many holes behind, and that in this part it has circular. I imagine it, said Marcella. Well, then, suppose that a modeler seated within is fashioning many statues. Imagine again that the substance of clay is constantly brought to him from without, through the holes, by many men, who do not any of them see the artist himself. Now, suppose the house to be covered with mist and clouds, and nothing visible to those who are outside, but only the holes. Um, let this also be supposed, she said, and that each one of those who are laboring together to provide the clay has one hole allotted to himself, into which he alone has to bring and deposit his own clay, not touching any other hole. And if again he shall officiously endeavor to open that which is allotted to another, let him be threatened with fire and scourges. Well, now, consider further what comes after this. The modeler within, going round to the holes and taking privately for his modeling the clay which he finds at each hole, and having in a certain number of months made his model, giving it back through the same hole, having this for his rule, that every lump of clay which is capable of being molded shall be worked up indifferently even if it be unlawfully thrown by any one through another's hole. For the clay has done no wrong, and therefore, as being blameless, should be molded and formed. But that he who in opposition to the ordinance and law deposited it in another's hole should be punished as a criminal and transgressor. For the clay should not be blamed, but he who did this in violation of what is right. For, through incontinence having carried it away, he secretly by violence deposited it in another's hole. You say most truly. Chapter 5 Following up the same argument and now that these things are completed, it remains for you to apply this picture, my wisest of friends, to the things which have already been spoken of, comparing the house to the invisible nature of our generation, and the entrance adjacent to the mountains, to the sending down of our souls from heaven, and their descent into the bodies. The holes are compared to the female sex and the modeler to the creative power of God, which under the cover of generation, making use of our nature, invisibly forms us men within, working the garments for the souls. Those who carry the clay represent the male sex in the comparison. When thirsting for children, they bring and cast in seed into the natural channels of the female as those in the comparison cast clay into the holes. For the seed, which, so to speak, partakes of a divine creative power, is not to be thought guilty of the incentives to incontinence. And art always works up the matter submitted to it. And nothing is to be considered as evil in itself, but becomes so by the act of those who used it in such a way. 
for when properly and purely made use of, it comes out pure. But if disgracefully and improperly, then the act becomes disgraceful. For how did iron, which is discovered for the benefit of agriculture and the arts, injure those who sharpened it for murderous battles? Or how did gold or silver or brass, or, to take it collectively, the whole of the workable earth, injure those who, ungratefully toward their Creator, make a wrong use of them by turning parts of them into various kinds of idols? And if any one should supply wool from that which had been stolen to the weaving art, that art regarding this one thing only, manufactures the material submitted to it. If it will receive the preparation, rejecting nothing of that which is serviceable to itself, since that which is stolen is here not to be blamed, being lifeless. And therefore the material itself is to be wrought and adorned, but he who is discovered to have abstracted it unjustly should be punished. So, in like manner, the violators of marriage, and those who break the strings of the harmony of life, as of a harp, raging with lust and letting loose their desires in adultery, should themselves be tortured and punished, for they do a great wrong, stealing from the gardens of others the embraces of generation. But the seed itself, as in the case of the wool, should be formed, and endowed with life. Chapter 6 God cares even for adulterous births, angels given to them as guardians. But what need is there to protract the argument by using such examples? For nature could not thus in a little time accomplish so great a work, without divine help. For who gave the bones their fixed nature, and who bound the yielding members with nerves, to be extended and relaxed at the joints? Or who prepared channels for the blood, and a soft windpipe for the breath? Or what god caused the humors to ferment, mixing them with blood and forming the soft flesh out of the earth? but only the supreme artist making us to be man, the rational and living image of himself, and forming it like wax in the womb from moist slight seed. Or by whose providence was it that the fetus was not suffocated by damp when shut up within, in the connection of the vessels? Or who, after it was brought forth and had come into the light, changed it from weakness and smallness to size and beauty and strength, unless God himself, the supreme artist, as I said, making by his creative power copies of Christ and living pictures. Whence also we have received from the inspired writings that those who are begotten, even though it be in adultery, are committed to guardian angels. But if they came into being in opposition to the will and decree of the blessed nature of God, how should they be delivered over to angels to be nourished with much gentleness and indulgence? And how, if they had to accuse their own parents, could they confidently before the judgment seat of Christ invoke him and say, Thou didst not, O Lord, grudge us this common light? But these appointed us to death, despising thy command. For, he says, children begotten of unlawful beds are witnesses of wickedness against their parents at their trial. Chapter 7 The Rational Soul Comes from God Himself Chastity not the only good, although the best and most honored. And perhaps there will be room for some to argue plausibly among those who are wanting in discrimination and judgment 
that this fleshly garment of the soul, being planted by men, is shaped spontaneously apart from the sentence of God. If, however, he should teach that the immortal being of the soul also is sown along with the mortal body, he will not be believed, for the Almighty alone breathes into man the undying and undecaying part, as also it is he alone who is the creator of the invisible and indestructible. For he says, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And those artificers who, to the destruction of men, make images in human form, not perceiving and knowing their own Maker, are blamed by the Word, which says in the Book of Wisdom, a book full of all virtue, His heart is ashes, his hope is more vile than earth, and his life of less value than clay. Forasmuch as he knew not his Maker, and him that inspired into him an active soul, and breathed in a living spirit. That is, God the Maker of all men. Therefore also, according to the Apostle, He will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And now, although this subject be scarcely completed, Yet there are others that which remain to be discussed. For when one thoroughly examines and understands those things which happen to man according to his nature, he will know not to despise the procreation of children, although he applauds chastity and prefers it in honor. For although honey be sweeter and more pleasant than other things, we are not for that reason to consider other things bitter which are mixed up in the natural sweetness of fruits. And in support of these statements I will bring forward a trustworthy witness, namely Paul, who says, So then, he that giveth her in marriage doth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doth better. Now, the word in setting forth that which is better and sweeter, did not intend to take away the inferior, but arranges so as to assign to each its own proper use and advantage. For there are some to whom it is not given to attain virginity, and there are others whom he no longer wills to be excited by procreations to lust and to be defiled. But henceforth, to meditate and to keep the mind upon the transformation of the body to the likeness of angels, when they neither marry nor are given in marriage. According to the infallible words of the Lord, since it is not given to all to attain that undefiled state of being a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, but manifestly to those only who are able to preserve the ever-blooming and unfading flower of virginity. For it is the custom of the prophetic word to compare the church to a flower-covered and variegated meadow, adorned and crowned not only with the flowers of virginity, but also with those of childbearing and of continence. For it is written, Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in a vesture of gold, wrought about with diverse colors. These words, O Arete, I bring, according to my ability, to this discussion, on behalf of the truth. And when Theophila had thus spoken, Theopatra said that applause arose from all the virgins approving of her discourse and that when they became silent, after a long pause, Thalia arose, for to her had been assigned the third place in the contest, that which came after Theophila. And she then, as I think, followed and spoke. 
End of Discourse 2 Banquet of the Ten Virgins by St. Methodius Discourse 3 Thalia Chapter 1 Passages of Holy Scripture Compared You seem to me, Theophila, to excel all in action and in speech, and to be second to none in wisdom. For there is no one who will find fault with your discourse, however contentious and contradictory he may be. Yet while everything else seems rightly spoken, one thing, my friend, distresses and troubles me considering that that wise and most spiritual man, I mean Paul, would not vainly refer to Christ and the Church, the union of the first man and woman, if the Scripture meant nothing higher than what is conveyed by the mere words and the history. For if we are to take the Scripture as a bare representation, totally referring to the union of man and woman, for what reason should the Apostle, calling these things to remembrance, and guiding us, as I opine, into the way of the Spirit, allegorize the history of Adam and Eve as having a reference to Christ in the Church? For the passage in Genesis reads thus, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. But the Apostle, considering this passage, by no means, as I said, intends to take it according to its mere natural sense, as referring to the union of man and woman, as you do. For you, explaining the passage in too natural a sense, laid down that the Spirit is speaking only of conception and births, that the bone taken from the bone was made another man, and that living creatures coming together swell like trees at the time of conception. But he, more spiritually referring the passage to Christ, teaches thus. He that loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord the Church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the Church. Chapter 2 The Digressions of the Apostle Paul The Character of His Doctrine Nothing in it contradictory Condemnation of Origen, who wrongly turned everything into allegory let it not disturb you if in discussing one class of subjects Paul should pass over into another so as to appear to mix them up and to import matters foreign to the subject under consideration. Departing from the question, as now, for instance, for wishing, as it seems, to strengthen most carefully the argument on behalf of chastity, he prepares the mode of argument beforehand, beginning with the more persuasive mode of speech. For the character of his speech being very various, and arranged for the purpose of progressive proof, begins gently, but flows forward into a style which is loftier and more magnificent. And then, again changing to what is deep, he sometimes finishes with what is simple and easy, and sometimes with what is more difficult and delicate. And yet, introducing nothing which is foreign to the subject by these changes, but bringing them all together according to a certain marvelous relationship, he works into one the question which is set forth as his subject. 
It is needful, then, that I should more accurately unfold the meaning of the Apostle's arguments, yet rejecting nothing of what has been said before. For you seem to me, O Theophila, to have discussed those words of the Scripture amply and clearly, and to have set them forth as they are, without mistake. For it is a dangerous thing, wholly to despise the literal meaning, as has been said, and especially the li literal meaning of Genesis, where the unchangeable decrees of God for the constitution of the universe are set forth, in agreement with which, even until now, the world is perfectly ordered, most beautifully, in accordance with a perfect rule, until the lawgiver himself, having rearranged it, wishing to order it anew, shall break up the first laws of nature by a fresh disposition. But since it is not fitting to leave the demonstration of the argument unexamined, and, so to speak, half lame, come, let us, as it were completing our pair, bring forth the analogical sense, looking more deeply into the scripture. For Paul is not to be despised when he passes over the literal meaning, and shows that the words extend to Christ and the Church. Chapter 3 Comparison Instituted Between the First and Second Adam And first we must inquire if Adam can be likened to the Son of God, when he was found in the transgression of the fall, and heard the sentence, Dust you are, and unto dust shall you return. For how shall he be considered the firstborn of every creature, who after the creation of the earth and the firmament was formed out of clay? And how shall he be admitted to be the tree of life, who was cast out for his transgression, lest he should again stretch forth his hand and eat of it? and live forever. For it is necessary that a thing which is likened unto anything else should in many respects be similar and analogous to that of which it is the similitude, and not have its constitution opposite and dissimilar. For one who should venture to compare the uneven to the even, or harmony to discord, would not be considered rational. But the even should be compared to that which in its nature is even, although it should be even only in a small measure. And the white should be compared to that which in its nature is white, even though it should be very small, and should show but moderately the whiteness by which it is called white. Now it is beyond all doubt, clear to every one, that that which is sinless and incorrupt is even and harmonious and bright as wisdom, but that that which is mortal and sinful is uneven and discordant and cast out as guilty and subject to condemnation. Chapter 4 Some things here hard and too slightly treated, and apparently not sufficiently brought out according to the rule of theology. Such, then, I consider to be the objections urged by many who, despising, as it seems, the wisdom of Paul, dislike comparing the first man to Christ. For come, let us consider how rightly Paul compared Adam to Christ, not only considering him to be the type and image, but also that Christ himself became the very same thing because the eternal word fell on him. For it was fitting that the firstborn of God, the first shoot, the only begotten, even the wisdom of God, should be joined to the first formed man, and first and firstborn of mankind, and should become incarnate. And this was Christ, a man filled with the pure and perfect Godhead, and God received into man. 
for it was most suitable that the oldest of the eons and the first of the archangels, when about to hold communion with men, should dwell in the oldest and the first of men, even Adam. And thus, when renovating those things which were from the beginning, and forming them again of the Virgin by the Spirit, he frames the same, just as at the beginning, when the earth was still virgin and untilled, God, taking mold, formed the reasonable creature from it without seed. Chapter 5 A Passage of Jeremiah Examined And here I may adduce the prophet Jeremiah as a trustworthy and lucid witness who speaks thus. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the potter's wheel, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. For when Adam, having been formed out of clay, was still soft and moist, and not yet like a tile made hard and incorruptible, sin ruined him flowing and dropping down upon him like water. And therefore God, moistening him afresh, and forming anew the same clay to his honor, having first hardened and fixed it in the virgin's womb, and united and mixed it with the word, brought it forth into life, no longer soft and broken, lest, being overflowed again by streams of corruption from without, it should become soft and perish, as the Lord in his teaching shows in the parable of the finding of the sheep, where my Lord says to those standing by, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Chapter 6 The Whole Number of Spiritual Sheep Man a Second Choir After the Angels To the Praise of God The Parable of the Lost Sheep Explained now, since he truly was and is, being in the beginning with God, and being God, he is the chief commander and shepherd of the heavenly ones, whom all reasonable creatures obey and attend, who tends in order and numbers the multitudes of the blessed angels. For this is the equal and perfect number of immortal creatures divided according to their races and tribes, man also being here taken into the flock. For he also was created without corruption, that he might honor the King and Maker of all things, responding to the shouts of the melodious angels which came from heaven. But when it came to pass that by transgressing the commandment he suffered a terrible and destructive fall, being thus reduced to a state of death. For this reason, the Lord says, that he came from heaven into a human life, leaving the ranks and armies of angels. For the mountains are to be explained by the heavens, and the ninety-nine sheep by the principalities and powers which the captain and shepherd left when he went down to seek the lost one. For it remained that man should be included in this catalogue and number, the Lord lifting him up and wrapping him round, that he might not again, as I said, be overflowed and swallowed up by the waves of deceit. For with this purpose the word assumed the nature of man, that having overcome the serpent, he might by himself destroy the condemnation which had come into being along with man's ruin. For it was fitting 
that the evil one should be overcome by no other but by him whom he had deceived, and whom he was boasting that he held in subjection. Because no otherwise was it possible that sin and condemnation should be destroyed, unless that same man on whose account it had been said, Dust you are, and unto dust you shall return, should be created anew, and undo the sentence which for his sake had gone forth on all, that, as in Adam, at first all die, even so, again, in Christ, who assumed the nature and position of Adam, should all be made alive. Chapter 7 The Works of Christ Proper to God and to Man the works of him who is one. And now we seem to have said almost enough on the fact that man has become the organ and clothing of the only begotten, and what he was who came to dwell in him. But the fact that there is no moral inequality or discord may again be considered briefly from the beginning. For he speaks well, who says that that is in its own nature good and righteous and holy, by participation of which other things become good, and that wisdom is in connection with God, and that, on the other hand, sin is unholy and unrighteous and evil. For life and death, corruption and incorruption, are two things in the highest degree opposed to each other. For life is a moral equality, but corruption and inequality, and righteousness and prudence a harmony, but unrighteousness and folly a discord. Now man, being between these, is neither righteousness itself nor unrighteousness but being placed midway between incorruption and corruption, to whichever of these he may incline, is said to partake of the nature of that which has laid hold of him. Now, when he inclines to corruption, he becomes corrupt and mortal, and when to incorruption, he becomes incorrupt and immortal. For being placed midway between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of the fruit of which he tasted, he was changed into the nature of the latter, himself being neither of the tree of life nor that of corruption. But having been shown forth as mortal from his participation in and presence with corruption, and again as incorrupt and immortal, by connection with and participation in life, as Paul also taught, saying, Corruption shall not inherit incorruption, nor death life, rightly defining corruption and death to be that which corrupts and kills, and not that which is corrupted and dies, and incorruption and life that which gives life and immortality, and not that which receives life and immortality. And thus man is neither a discord and an inequality, nor an equality and a harmony. But when he received discord, which is transgression and sin, he became discordant and unseemly. But when he received harmony, that is, righteousness, he became a harmonious and seemly organ, in order that the Lord, the incorruption which conquered death, might harmonize the resurrection with the flesh, not suffering it again to be inherited by corruption. And on this point also, let these statements suffice. Chapter 8 the bones and flesh of wisdom, the side out of which the spiritual Eve is formed, the Holy Spirit, the woman, the helpmeet of Adam, 
VIRGINS BETROTHED TO CHRIST For it has already been established, by no contemptible arguments from Scripture, that the first man may be properly referred to Christ himself, and is no longer a type and representation and image of the only begotten, but has actually become wisdom and the Word. For man, having been composed like water, of wisdom and life, has become identical with this very same untainted light which poured into him. Whence it was that the Apostle directly referred to Christ the words which had been spoken of Adam. For thus will it be most certainly agreed that the church is formed out of his bones and flesh. And it was for this cause that the Word, leaving his Father in heaven, came down to be joined to his wife, and slept in the trance of his passion, and willingly suffered death for her, that he might present the church to himself glorious and blameless, having clem cleansed her by the laver, for the receiving of the spiritual and blessed seed which is sown by him, who with whispers implants it in the depths of the mind, and is conceived and formed by the church as by a woman, so as to give birth and nourishment to virtue. For in this way too the command, Increase and multiply, is duly fulfilled, the church increasing daily in greatness and beauty and multitude by the union and communion of the Word, who now still comes down to us and falls into a trance by the memorial of his passion. For otherwise the church could not conceive believers and give them new birth by the labor of regeneration, unless Christ, emptying himself for their sake, that he might be contained by them, as I said, through the recapitulation of his passion, should die again, coming down from heaven and being joined to his wife, the church, should provide for a certain power being taken from his own side, so that all who are built up in him should grow up, even those who are born again by the labor, receiving of his bones and his flesh, that is, of his holiness and of his glory. For he who says that the bones and flesh of wisdom are understanding and virtue, says most rightly, and that the side is the spirit of truth, the paraclete, of whom the illuminated receiving are fitly born again to incorruption. For it is impossible for anyone to be a partaker of the Holy Spirit, and to be chosen a member of Christ unless the word first came down upon him and fell into a trance, in order that he, being filled with the Spirit, and rising again from sleep with him who was laid to sleep for his sake, should be able to receive renew renewal and restoration. For he may fitly be called the side of the word, even the sevenfold spirit of truth, according to the prophet of whom God taking in the trance of Christ, that is, after his incarnation and passion, prepares a helpmeet for him, I mean the souls which are betrothed and given in marriage to him. For it is frequently the case that the scriptures thus call the assembly and mass of the believers by the name of the church. The more perfect in their progress being led up to be the one person and body of the church. For those who are the better, and who embrace the truth more clearly, being delivered from the evils of the flesh, become on account of their perfect purification and faith, a church and helpmeet of Christ, betrothed and given in marriage to him as a virgin, according to the apostle 
so that receiving the pure and genuine seed of his doctrine, they may cooperate with him, helping in preaching for the salvation of others. And those who are still imperfect and beginning their lessons are born to salvation and shaped, as my mother's, by those who are more perfect, until they are brought forth and regenerated unto the greatness and beauty of virtue. And so these, in their turn making progress, having become a church, assist in laboring for the birth and nurture of other children, accomplishing in the receptacle of the soul, as in a womb, the blameless will of the Word. Chapter 9 The Dispensation of Grace in Paul the Apostle now, we should consider the case of the renowned Paul, that when he was not yet perfect in Christ, he was first born and suckled, Ananias preaching to him and renewing him in baptism, as the history in the Acts relates. But when he was grown to a man and was built up, then, being molded to spiritual perfection, he was made the helpmeet and bride of the Word and receiving and conceiving the seeds of life, he who was before a child becomes a church and a mother, himself laboring in birth of those who through him believed in the Lord, until Christ was formed and born in them also. For he says, My little children, of whom I labor in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. And again, in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. It is evident, then, that the statement respecting Eve and Adam is to be referred to the church and Christ. For this is truly a great mystery, and a supernatural, of which I, from my weakness and dullness, am unable to speak according to its worth and greatness. Nevertheless, let us attempt it. It remains that I speak to you on what follows, and of its signification. End of Part 1 of Discourse 3 Banquet of the Ten Virgins by St. Methodius Discourse 3 Part 2 Chapter 10 The Doctrine of the Same Apostle Concerning Purity Now Paul, when summoning all persons to sanctification and purity, in this way referred that which had been spoken concerning the first man and Eve, in a secondary sense, to Christ and the Church, in order to silence the ignorant, now deprived of all excuse. For men who are incontinent in consequence of the uncontrolled impulses of sensuality in them, dare to force the scriptures beyond their true meaning, so as to twist into a defense of their incontinence the saying, Increase and multiply, and the other, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And they are not ashamed to run counter to the Spirit, but, as though born for this purpose, they kindle up the smoldering and lurking passion, fanning and provoking it. And therefore he, cutting off very sharply these dishonest follies and invented excuses, and having arrived at the subject of instructing them how men should behave to their wives, showing that it should be as Christ did to the church, who gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. He referred back to Genesis, mentioning the things spoken concerning the first man, and explaining these things as bearing on the subject before him, that he might take away occasion for the abuse of the, these passages from those who taught the sensual gratification of the body under the pretext of begetting children. Chapter 11. The Same Argument 
For consider, virgins, how he, desiring with all his might that believers in Christ should be chaste, endeavors by many arguments to show them the dignity of chastity. As when he says, Now, concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Thence showing already, very clearly, that it is good not to touch a woman, laying it down and setting it forth unconditionally. But afterwards, being aware of the weakness of the less continent and their passion for intercourse, he permitted those who are unable to govern the flesh to use their own wives, rather than shamefully transgressing, to give themselves up to fornication. Then, after having given this permission, he immediately added these words, Let Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Which means, If you, such as you are, cannot on account of the incontinence and softness of your bodies be perfectly continent, I will rather permit you to have intercourse with your own wives, lest, professing perfect continence, ye be constantly tempted by the evil one and be inflamed with lust after other men's wives. Chapter 12 Paul, an example to widows, and to those who do not live with their wives. Come now, and let us examine more carefully the very words which are before us, and observe that the Apostle did not grant these things unconditionally to all, but first laid down the reason on account of which he was led to this. For having set forth that it is good for a man not to touch a woman, he added immediately, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. That is, on account of the fornication which would arise from your being unable to restrain your voluptuousness. And let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Do not defraud one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. And this is very carefully considered. By permission, he says, showing that he was giving counsel, not of command. For he receives command respecting chastity and the not touching of a woman, but permission respecting those who are unable, as I said, to chasten their appetites. These things, then, he lays down concerning men and women who are married to one spouse, or who shall hereafter be so. But we must now examine carefully the Apostle's language respecting men who have lost their wives, and women who have lost their husbands, and what he declares on this subject. I say, therefore, he goes on, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Here also he persisted in giving the preference to continence, for taking himself as a notable example in order to stir them up to emulation, he challenged his hearers to this state of life, teaching that it was better that a man who had been bound to one wife should henceforth remain single, as he also did. But if, on the other hand, this should be a matter of difficulty to any one, on account of the strength of animal passion, he allows that one who is in such a condition may, by permission, contract a second marriage. Not as though he expressed the opinion that a second marriage was in itself good, but judging it better than burning, just as though, in the fast which prepares for the Easter celebration, one should offer food to another who was dangerously ill, and say, 
In truth, my friend, it were fitting and good that you should bravely hold out like us, and partake of the same things, for it is forbidden even to think of food to-day. But since you are held down and weakened by disease, and cannot bear it, therefore, by permission, we advise you to eat food, lest being quite unable from sickness to hold up against the desire for food, you perish. Thus also the Apostle speaks here, first saying that he wished all were healthy and continent, as he also was, but afterwards allowing a second marriage to those who are burdened with the disease of the passions, lest they should be wholly defiled by fornication, goaded on by the itching of the organs of generation to promiscuous intercourse, considering such a second marriage far preferable to burning and indecency. Chapter 13 The Doctrine of Paul Concerning Virginity Explained I have now brought to an end what I have to say respecting continence, and marriage, and chastity, and intercourse with men, and in which of these there is help toward progress in righteousness. But it still remains to speak concerning virginity, if indeed anything be prescribed on this subject. Let us then treat this subject also, for it stands thus. Now, concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. Yet I give my judgment, as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord, to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Are you bound unto a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. Having given his opinion with great caution respecting virginity, and being about to advise him who wished it to give his virgin in marriage, so that none of those things which conduce to sanctification should be of necessity and by compulsion, but according to the free purpose of the soul. For this is acceptable to God. He does not wish these things to be said as by authority, and as the mind of the Lord with reference to the giving of a virgin in marriage. For after he had said, if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Directly afterward, with the greatest caution, he modified his statement, showing that he had advised these things by human permission, and not by divine. So immediately after that he had said, If a virgin marry, she has not sinned. He added, Such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you by which he means, I, sparing you, such as you are, consented to these things, because you have chosen to think thus of them, that I may not seem to hurry you on by violence or compel any one to this. But yet, if it shall please you who find chastity hard to bear, rather to turn to marriage, I consider it to be profitable for you to restrain yourselves in the gratification of the flesh not making your marriage an occasion for abusing your own vessels to uncleanness. Then he adds, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And again going on and challenging them to the same things, he confirmed his statement, powerfully supporting the state of virginity and adding expressly the following words to those which he had spoken before. He exclaimed, I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, but he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, 
that she may be holy, both in body and spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now it is clear to all, without any doubt, that to care for the things of the Lord, and to please God, is much better than to care for the things of this world, and to please one's wife. For who is there so foolish and blind as not to perceive in this statement the higher praise which Paul accords to chastity? And this, he says, I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely. Chapter 14 Virginity, a Gift of God The Purpose of Virginity, Not Rashly to Ad be adopted by any one. Consider besides how, in addition to the words already quoted, he commends the state of virginity as a gift of God. Wherefore he rejects those of the more incontinent who under the influence of vainglory would advance to this state, advising them to marry, lest in their time of manly strength, the flesh stirring up the desires and passions, they should be goaded on to defile the soul. For let us consider what he lays down. But if any man think that he behaves himself uncomely towards his virgin, he says, If she pass the flower of her age, and needs so require, let him do what he will. He sins not. Let him marry. Properly here, preferring marriage to uncomeliness in the case of those who had chosen the state of virginity but afterwards finding it intolerable and grievous and in word boasting of their per perseverance before men out of shame but indeed no longer having the power to persevere in the life of a eunuch but for him who of his own free will and purpose decides to preserve his flesh in virgin purity having no necessity, that is, passion calling forth his loins to intercourse, for there are, as it seems, differences in men's bodies, such a one, contending and struggling, and zealously abiding by his profession, and admirably fulfilling it, he exhorts to abide and to preserve it, according the highest prize to virginity. For he that is able, he says, and ambitious to preserve his flesh pure, does better. But he that is unable, and enters into marriage lawfully, and does not indulge in secret corruption, does well. And now, enough has been said on these subjects. Let any one who will take in his hand the epistle to the Corinthians, and examining all its passages one by one, then consider what we have said, comparing them together, as to whether there is not a perfect harmony and agreement between them. These things, according to my power, O Arete, I offer to you as my contribution on the subject of chastity. Eubolios Through many things, O Gregorian, Having measured and crossed a mighty sea of words, she has scarcely come to the subject. Gregorian So it seems. But come, I must mention the rest of what was said, in order, going through it and repeating it, while I seem to have the sound of it dwelling in my ears, before it flies away and escapes. For the remembrance of things lately heard is easily effaced from the aged. <laughs> Say on, then, for we have come to have the pleasure of hearing these discourses. And then, after, as you observed, Thalia has descended from her smooth and unbroken course to the earth. Theopatra, she said, followed her in order, and spoke as follows. End of Discourse 3